Belevinak everyone, my name is Saini Vuli, and before we get started on this workshop, I would like us to collectively take a moment to acknowledge all Indigenous and First People of the land and space in which we live and breathe. For our community at Highland College, we recognize that we are on occupied Duwamish, Coast Salish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands, and we want to thank all relations and tribes today as we prepare to hold space as a community. We recognize that all of us are joining this conversation from different areas, so we want to invite you to reflect and thank Indigenous and First Peoples of the land and spaces in which you are coming from. Thank you. Good morning, Highline, and welcome to the 23rd Annual Unity Through Diversity, Reclaiming Education, Honoring Resilience, Day 3 of our programming. Uh, my name is Shannon Waits, and I'm the Director of Assessment and Placement at Highline College and a member of the Unity Week uh, Committee. So, uh, you know, as you know, the coronavirus has impacted our global community uh, beyond description. And yet we're really grateful for this opportunity to continue with our programming and virtually connect with our Highline family, especially at this time. Um, so uh, thank you to everybody that has been on our Unity Week committee um, and, and especially to the Unity Week team right now that's holding it down on the back end of this presentation for us all. Uh, it is now my incredible honor uh, to introduce our Unity Week panel today of folks from Seattle Independent Artist Sustainability Effort, or uh, SIASE. So established during the COVID-19 pandemic, Seattle Independent Artist Sustainability Effort is a horizontal coalition formed for and by artists to advance self-determination in our communities during these trying times. We recognize that the immediate and devastating impact of COVID-19 on artists is indicative of historic widespread systemic failure under capitalism to honor the role and intrinsic value of art in the lives of individuals and communities uh, and equitably comp compensate for that labor. Um, they also recognize the disparate experience of impact to artists and disparate access to information and relief resources in our communities as the result of long-standing inequities in broader systems of education, technology and creative industries, and philanthropy nonprofit industrial complex. Um, so Stacey has come together as artists, cultural workers, and community organizers to fill gaps in the service, access, and resources for the most vulnerable among us. Um, and through these efforts, they seek to facilitate holistic analysis and systemic change in our city towards a more equitable and community rooted creative ecosystem that provides for us all. You are about to meet some incredible artists that, um, I am incredible fan of in our Seattle area. Um, so please join me in welcoming our incredible panel. Hi, everybody. It is very um, exciting to be here. I want to acknowledge how kind of awkward and surreal to have to do this virtually is. Um, my name is Julie C. I'm a hip hop artist. We love uh, participation and, and call and response and things like that. So not being able to see uh, is um, a little strange. So if everyone could just like hit an F for me, if you're paying attention right now in the chat box, just so I know you're there and out there. There we go. There we go. Hey, thank you so much. <laughs> I love it. Appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to just real briefly let the rest of us introduce each other real quickly or introduce themselves. And I guess I'll call on y'all um, in the order that I see on my screen here. Uh, first, we got Kyle. Hey, um, um, and sorry, I didn't even give you a prop. I wanna share your name and um, what is your artistry? What is your craft? And let's say one thing you're grateful for. All right, uh, I'm Kyle Hartman. I use he, him pronouns. I, I work primarily in theater. I work for Intamon Theater. I am their education uh, programs coordinator. Um, I am also uh, working with a youth cohort of artistic leaders on uh, unraveling and dissecting what inequities exist within the school district's um, curricular structure, as well as in the system of youth arts within Seattle um, to determine pathways towards access for all youth. So most of my work is in theater. Um, I love it. Uh, I think live storytelling is the best way to convey um, hope, resilience, and uh, optimism um, for a better future. Uh, and one thing that I am uh, grateful for is 
I would say thing I'm grateful for is the cherry blossom tree that is outside of my window right now. Thank you, Kyle. Let's go to Ariel. Hey everybody, um, my name is Ariel Bradler. I am an arts administrator and a theater director by trade. Um, I currently am the executive director of Theater Puget Sound, which is an art service organization. We help support both independent artists and small and large size organizations, theatrical, theatrically based organizations. Um, and one thing I am grateful for is my family right now. If I have to be in a small house with some people, these are the people I wanna be with. Beautiful. Next we got Poesia. Um, hi everybody, my name is Poesia Mariarte. My other name, my real name is Maria Luisa Guillén Valdovinos. Um, I'm a visual hip hop artist, uh, teaching artist, and um, my mediums are from poetry to painting, um, but my passion is um, uh, rebelling against all systems of oppression, which is why I'm an artist. Um, and so um, something that I'm really grateful for is community. Um, and uh, even though I've been in quarantine, um, it's been, I've been getting so much like more communication with like people I've been building with over the years. Um, and then just like, um, it doesn't feel so lonely and it doesn't feel like um, I'm just like at home all the time. I feel like really connected even virtually like through, the, through this. So I'm really grateful um, we have this form of technology Grateful for you too, Mishad. Hello, my name is Mishad Savage. Uh, he, him, they, them. Uh, I'm from Seattle. I am a musical artist. I work as a vocalist, a guitarist, a composer, producer, and about a billion other things as time goes on. <laughs> um, yeah, um, what I am happy about today is that I am healthy and uh, that I am able to participate in a conversation like this safely and that we are able to, to have this dialogue. Thank you, Mashad. Then we have Matthew Lang. Hi there, my name is Matthew Lang. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I am a theater artist and a teaching artist by trade. And I do a lot of work in the community already. Um, I work as the lead organizer of the Transit Writers Union. I'm on the board of uh, Standing Against Foreclosures and Evictions. And uh, through that work, I'm uh, currently convening a small business roundtable to talk about what relief looks like at the Seattle city level. Um, and then with uh, SAFE, we're working with the Green Light Project, which is a uh, sex workers um, peer support group that is actually just came up with their own facility to bottle and package uh, hand sanitizer to get out to sex workers and to unhoused population. Um, also been doing a lot of uh, kind of behind the scenes work in the departments. Uh, the bathroom openings at the libraries, working on public spaces for unhoused folks uh, during this crisis. Um, so I'm bouncing all over the place, but uh, you know, it's interesting. I do a lot of, um, when, when Trump got elected, I realized that it was uh, really important as a white man to step up uh, and um, fight for the things that are maybe not, uh, maybe aren't the priorities for my community um, personally. But uh, when the COVID crisis hit me as an artist, uh, this is my community and this is my first community and this is my home. So um, I found a really easy home uh, with the folks at Seattle Independent Artist Sustainability Effort because um, because it's so close to my heart. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew had us all out in um, in solidarity with Transit Writers Union in front of Seattle City Hall this morning. So shouts out to that socially distanced direct action. Uh, last but not least, we have the legendary Laurie Goldston. Hi, I'm Laurie Goldston. Um, she, her, they, them. Good. I am a cellist and composer. I work with a lot of different kinds of musicians and other kinds of artists and sometimes writers, different kinds of people, all kinds of media. 
um, feeling very grateful uh, for working with these all these fabulous people and having uh, something so new because I've been mostly sort of functioning in a kind of artist to artist um, level, like not so much as part of an organization. I've been sort of um, in this kind of network of artists all over the world, really. So nice to have such a new project and sort of develop like this extremely new skill set during this time where it's easy, like feels like so many things are being taken away, hopefully temporarily, and then nice to have um, something so new coming coming in. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share now this screen. Uh, please forgive in advance if we have some technical challenges, but looks like everything is going all right right now. I'm going to pull up the chat box so I can see y'all too. Oh, wait, I shouldn't do that, huh? Never mind. This yeah. is one of the interpreters speaking. I'm unable to switch with my team because it says the host has stopped my video. Is it possible to allow the interpreters to start and stop their video? Check on that and get that fixed. All right, thank you for that. Um, gratitude to, to the interpreters too. Uh, really appreciate Elle's presence and to highlight for having us. All right, so I wanted to start with this question, but I'm realizing I might have a challenge here because I don't know if I can see y'all's, um, maybe, uh, maybe one of my panelists could um, answer, I would love, if y'all would drop the answer to what is art, what is your interpretation of art? Do y'all recognize this photo? I can't see you chatting at the same time as I'm showing this to you. Um, I see it, I recognize it. Is any of the participants want to pop in and talk about, maybe drop some answer into the chat box about what is your conception of art? And can my co-panelists see that chat box? <laughs> Y'all want to read some of the answers real quick? Totally. Yeah. We got uh, one response from uh, Laura saying expression. Expression, dope. Uh, another question from Hamsi Ig. Uh, expression or the application of human creative skill and imagination typically in a visual form such as painting or sculpture producing works to be appreciated primary primarily for their beauty or emotional power wow that was deep a plus yeah. i like what I, I like what alicia valencia said um ron is that uh, that really resonates with me what was that one madam Ronis. Ronis. Ooh, I love that one. I love that one. Let's leave that one. I, I love that one as well. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I would like y'all to hold uh, space for the definition of art being just simply social designation, just a word, a name of what we inherently as people are do uh, in our creative aspects of ourselves and souls. What is community? Let's hear some answers to that. Mm. In the chat box, anybody got a good one for that? Oh, I figured out how to read the chat box. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Connection and support is one I've seen. Support system. Mm. Word. For the purposes of this conversation, I would love for you to hold space to the concept that community is um, all these things, your people. Yes, community is accountability. Mm -hmm. What is rebellion? Pussy, do you wanna talk about this background picture? I, I took it from your social media post. <laughs> Um, so the background is of um, uh, Comandante Ramona. That was one of the lead um, commanders of the 
uh, Zapatista um, movement in Chiapas. And so she, um, she was um, one of the women that uh, pretty much um, established the women's revolutionary law within that movement and um, pushed for a lot of like uh, changes, um, not only in like political movements uh, for women, but also like in society in general. So she like, um, she's like the spirit of like the Zapatista movement. She passed away from cancer about 20 years ago. Um, but she, but she's like, um, she's like very known without within the movement as like one of the persons that has always advocated for um, women's rights and indigenous women's rights, uh, more specifically. Oh, thank you. I love Laura's answer in the uh, chat box too. Said so to speak up and fight back when injustice acts. When injustice, injust acts happen. Rebellion is action or words that undermine a group or authority. Word. Ooh, faith. That's a pretty dope one. Could I have um, Matthew? Maybe you want to read this. This is a quote. I wanted to set context for the framing of this discussion when we talk about our crazy non-linear um, combination and galvanization and what we're about to talk about today. So Matthew, could you read uh, the first part of this, please? Uh, what do I, how do I get to see reading? Oh, this guy right here. Boom, I got, finally got it side by side. For artists, community and rebellion are deeply linked. Art is social, historical, and contextual and our historical context offers deviance, rebellion. Our universal, if sometimes denied, admiration of wild-eyed libertine radicals, or at least of impetuous, brutally honest nonconformists, amounts to a set of shared values. These shared values make us a community. Again, this is a wonderful thing. It's worth embracing, reproducing, and celebrating. Art continues to hold potential and to point a way forward. Mishad, you wanna hit part two? Sure. When artists act consistent with these values, they present a threat to all the deadly banal powers of conformity, order, and commodity reproduction. It is our shared values, like the shared values of other radical groupings that empower us. Organized workers are a threat because they share the value of unity. It is through solidarity and recognition of collective power that unions have made wounds in the flesh of their opponents. Similarly, it is through the shared values of creativity, deviance, and honesty that artists can wound our enemies. And we do have enemies. Yes, we do. If that was like in a live room, I would ask all y'all to make a ooh sound or something like that. But um, on a more positive tip, by the way, that quote is from Zine um, that came out of Columbus, Ohio, but it's super dope. And I can drop a link to the um, PDF for y'all after the presentation, but it's a zine called Art Scab. Um, to shift things to a more positive light though for a second, could some of y'all drop, what is something you already do to care for yourself, uh, community, friends, or family into the chat box? What is an act of care you're currently engaged in or that you do on a regular? Panelists, y'all could pop in too. Video call. So presence, virtually, remotely, that's dope. We have someone in the Q&A that says smiling. Smiling. I like it. Exercise. Cooking. See, cook for my family. Stephanie says I'm sharing love with mail, calls, video snuggling with animals, just telling people I love them. More cooking a meal, food, right? Food. I have my... um. Be the people shirt on today. Food is food is care. Praying. Praying is care. Make sure to connect with my friends best as I can. Dope. So, oh, wearing a mask to protect. Yes, help is care. Caring of the health of others is care. Reading and yoga. Social distance. 
I appreciate all these answers. And I love the breadth of y'all's answers too. Jimmy says, reaching out to loved ones, health, painting rocks and leaving them, creating. So these are all examples um, that I would say examples of mutual aid, right? Could I have, um, who is the regular? Lori, are you down to read about this mutual aid screen? Yes. Let me just move this thing. Mutual aid is the practice of caring for one another. From each according to their abilities, to each according to need. It is not transactional, nor hierarchical, nor shaming, but instead life affirming and reciprocal. It is not charity, nor saviorism, nor a shelter for capital. It is an assertion of self-determination and collective power. If y'all feel that definition, or rather the distinction between mutual aid and charity, could you guys hit some Fs in the chat box real quickly? If that's a distinction that's understood, heard, felt. Yeah, there we go. All right. Thank you all for being participatory with me. <laughs> this is helping me a lot because I can't see your faces. Um, I wanted to set a context to give a definition for mutual aid because early in March, um, this account, COVID-19 Mutual Aid, popped up on Instagram and Facebook. Um, at the time, I think I wasn't even connected to, didn't know who was behind it. This was the first post, the one on the left. The one on the right off top was um, following the very same day. Let's take a minute to check that out. But actually, let's look a little bit more specifically. A mutual aid inherently is about community, is about care. It's about, and it is because of that, entrusting the people to serve and help themselves and each other, um, inherently radical. On this account, I think this post was from maybe a week later, um, talking about public health, but talking about it in a way that was framing health in contrast with militarized force, right? Enforcement. I urge everybody right now, pick up your phone, follow this account if you're not already following. It grew so rapidly in the, in the next few weeks through March. Um, I believe that now it's something at 15K followers. Um, oh, this slide is out of order, okay. Poesia, do you want to speak a little bit about COVID-19 Mutual Aid Solidarity Network? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, uh, so this Solidarity Network um, is based on a non-hierarchical model of organizing. So there's no centralization, if that makes sense. So there's like no one person that directs the, um, the direction of this um, work that we're doing. So we, there's different groups uh, uh, that are working groups within this uh, network. And so my participation is mostly through the like fund distribution. So developing um, an ethical way of giving money to our communities that aren't like uh, replicating capitalist or, um, or settler colonial notions of money and access to money and resources. So, um, so the thing, so, one of the most important things to this work is recognizing that people are actively resisting um, what is happening in terms of the oppression from like the capitalist class. So, um, so, some of, so some of the first communities that we gave money to was people that are resisting inside the prisons across Washington. Um, and then um, we gave 15 families $500 and we gave 15 other families from the uh, Tacoma Detention Center, um, $500. So, so that's a th total of 30 families that are currently um, experiencing a member of their family uh, in custody um, or in prison. Um, and so, um, so we, we, a lot of us are, have been building with people in community. So we kind of know who knows um, who's in those movements. So, um, so the first network we gave money to was La Resistencia, which is an organization, which is like a community led, prisoner led organization for, 
that is working towards dismantling the Tacoma Detention Center. Um, and then last week we gave uh, $22,000 to farm workers from the community to community that will be distributed to 45 families uh, up in Whatcom County. And we have distributed food to pretty much like 13,000 families and majority of those food donations have been volunteers that have been giving food out of their own pockets. Um, so in the general pool of money, we have fun, we have fundraised at this point, like almost $230,000. Um, and so it's important for me to voice that a lot of the people that are doing this work are autonomous, anarchists or radicals who have been also very critical of like the nonprofit industrial complex and the need to be saviors to our communities. Like we don't work within that logic. We know that there's an urgent need for money and um, the government has failed to provide resources and funds money to some of these communities. Um, so we're not, we know it's like band-aid work, like it's temporarily, but what we're looking towards building is long-term movements that are able to, to work outside of these systems and outside of like the nonprofit, outside of like um, state agencies. And so at the core of mutual aid is understanding that our survival is interlinked. Like if I'm not doing well, um, then uh, my community is not doing well. So even, not thinking as an individual, but that even like when we go out in public wearing a face mask, we're not just doing it for our own, own health, we're doing it for the for the wellness of our communities too. So um, so this work is, is not at all for us to get a gold medal, it's because the necessity is there. Um, and like, um, and a lot of, and so we, we have fundraised $75,000 that will be given to undocumented peoples. Um, and so like, um, so all this money is the community's money. This is money that people trusted us with to make sure we have an anti-capitalist approach to distribution of money resources. But like from my perspective um, and doing this work is like what we need is reparations. Um, at a like national level in order to address the economic inequality uh, within poor black and brown and working class peoples. And, and so like, um, so mutual aid is building a strong core of network. And on Friday, we're gonna see even more like, you know, the work um, that is being done by workers that are about to go on strike. And so us being in community is we're, we're we have to support all those workers going on strike because it's part of our mutual aid work because without those workers we wouldn't have we wouldn't be able to eat and without farm workers having access to health care or face mask or protection we're also unsafe because like um so we we have to rethink the way we think of public wellness and uh community wellness outside of like a privatization of the healthcare system and more towards a community centered healthcare system that prioritizes the people that are the most disenfranchised. Um, so um, yeah, I don't, any, any questions um, I can um, go into, um, I'll post the link on the like chat where you can uh, go to like the social media to find out more information. Like I mentioned, it's a network so that we don't have a spokesperson um, and there's so many ways you can get involved. So I will send that um, and if you're, interested in getting involved, I encourage you to find a core group of people and start brainstorming and thinking what your community needs in order to survive during this pandemic. Thank you so much for that super thorough, super thorough uh, breakdown and also perfect segue. Um, at the time that this account I mentioned before come up and started putting up these posts, I, I kind of through that process realized you know this is some of my folks that i worked with um, and have historically in my community doing this work and so um what i did is connected with the workers organizing group which at the time was creating a toolkit as a resource for workers of all industries um, this is the portion that we created uh that poesia helped to um, for artists and cultural workers and I'm, i'll drop a link i'm sorry that i don't have it on hand but um, I'll drop a link to this toolkit into the webinar chat later. Um, it's been it's been super useful, but it also allowed a framing for a collective analysis of what what is organizing for cultural work, right? 
for the most part, um, we do not have a very clear si situation of um, like a boss, a factory uh, in this old model. And so um, I'm not gonna have us read through all this now, but we'll provide links to you after this discussion um, of the entire toolkit. But this brings us to SACE. Um, SACE started many starts, hard to say. <laughs> but I'm, I pinpointed um, from my perspective as a facilitator, uh, starting at March 17th, 2020, which is a little bit over a month, a month ago, um, in recognition, and this is before there was an actually official uh, stay order from our, our governor, in recognition though about how the stay and the I social distancing and the impending reality of COVID, the impact that that was gonna have on artist communities that really um, rely heavily on, on physical gathering spaces to supplement income and to do the work that we do. Um, we, my coalition, Seattle Artist Coalition for Equitable Development, called together um, a meeting because we started to hear about folks um, that were organizing and that included COVID-19 Mutual Aid Solidarity. It included um, the Seattle Artist Relief Fund, which was one of the first relief funds that was out there and available and dispersing uh, money to community uh, prior to a lot of the other resources out there for anybody. And it was start and led by artists themselves um, and trusted artists of color inside our community. Um, but it also included the folks that are on this call now in different veins of that. So I would like to ask y'all if you would be down to pop in and share. Um, I guess I'll start with, uh, yeah, how you came to this meeting and what is your inspiration in this work as an artist to organize as artists? Matthew, you wanna start? Sure. Uh, yeah, I came to this work uh, by invitation of Julie C, actually, and um, I have long really felt the inequity in the arts community um, as, a, as an actor, as a theater artist, um, even as a director, and uh, feeling like no matter what I'm doing, uh, I am the low man on the totem pole, I don't have any actual say in what is going on at the organization level or uh, for any of the um, any of the movement that's happening in the artistic community. Um, so what CAS uh, brought for me was a forum for for us to grow power so that the choices aren't all in the hands of these white, uh, generally upper class um, folks that are arts administrators who are who who really shape the arts in Seattle and they're the ones who you know take home all the money at the end of the day like I know some theaters like the or other uh, large arts organizations their uh, their executive director might be taking home half a million to a million dollars in, in a year and their artists are scraping by so it's things like that that make me really uh, really irk me and make me really see that there's inequities in the system, as well as uh, recognizing that a lot of those arts administrators are just straight up white, right? And they, that's not the way it should be. And something that I am personally really um, committed to do is as a white man, uh, move through the white spaces that I'm allowed in um, because of that inherent privilege and break them up from the inside because they, uh, they're they inherently evil institutions uh, when you come, when come to it because it's keeping the status quo for a small amount of people who have power, who have wealth, who have access and keeping people who really have a lot to say, and a lot to bring to the artistic community and a lot to share and grow with out of it so um so that's why i'm happy to be here and that's why that's what really fires me up about this project Word, well, thank you um and michelle and Lori, you came to us by way of eric eric who was also um organizing i believe y'all were in conversations about freelancers coalition and so if y'all want to talk a little bit about that background briefly um Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, I've been talking for a long time with a lot of um, musicians, 
about, I think the, um, I mean, I've been working in Seattle for a long time and been a professional musician for a long time and have just seen this kind of, you know, slow and steady decline of, uh, in sort of how um, artists were paid and artists were treated and regarded and having um, sort of access to decision making and um, just being even sort of like recognized as a sort of viable, valuable entity and there being this kind of like rise of all these um, kind of like intermediaries, um, you know, sort of get taking like the power and voice and the artists just, just sort of disappearing. So I am lucky enough, I get to travel a lot. And as I tour, I um, tend to be most often in like uh, artist run spaces and artist run situation that's sort of just like the world that I've always liked functioning in. So I've had a chance to see the way a lot of things work in other places and the various ways people have come together to make things and have always kind of seen that privilege as also an obligation to sort of try to pass that on. And I don't, you know, I don't have um, any kind of like prescription for it, but I've just seen it work a lot of places in a lot of ways. I think also that's helped me having, you know, some perspective on how things happen here and ways that it could happen. And I've seen a lot of musicians, uh, I meet mean, I deal most with musicians, being a musician myself, um, that there's this kind of, um, every, like people sort of settle into this situation, the conditions that they're in. and. Uh, so I'd been sort of feeling partly just a need to bring up the discussion and have it be a really active discussion and sort of reframing of like, what's going on here? Like, does it really need to be this way? Is it okay this way? And that's been sort of um, groundwork. I've been, um, that turned out to be then, you know, really great groundwork for being in this situation that we're all in, which is this crazy crisis where none of us have a way to function the way we've functioned our whole lives as artists. So in this um, chaos, there's been sort of all this talk and all this action and these, you know, very, this chance for these lovely bridges to get built very quickly and very efficiently. So, um, so my hope then with the union is to have a, a chance to really, you know, focus on sort of plant this seed and really really tend to it and see what we can do to um, really develop solid community and um, kind of frame these questions and um, develop some really strong um, ideas and plans to get it uh, together out of this you know kind of mostly really crappy situation. Thank you so much. And we're going to get to the facts to it a little bit uh, later on. And finally, uh, the other like Ariel and Kyle who have joined us, um, the present namesake of SACE right now comes from their efforts, which actually started prior to this meeting. If y'all want to share a little bit about that and how you came to that effort. Yeah, so um, when the order from Governor Inslee to um, basically shut down any large gatherings of 50 people or more um, working in theater and working in the arts. I, in the span of 48 hours, saw probably like 90 to 95 percent of my friends and colleagues lose their jobs and their main sources of income. Um, and it, it, it lit a fire in me. Um, I am not very much um, an angry person, but I was very much an angry person in that situation because um, at that time, there was no immediate reaction um, or work being done to figure out how we're going to get by. So um, uh, I've only been in Seattle for about three years. So um, I turned towards like the grassroots method of organizing and just like reached out to friends and colleagues like on 
social media and said like, hey, let, let's just meet and like, let's talk through this situation. Let's figure out how we're gonna like, what we can do to support like our fellow artists, our community. Like I had no idea like what could be done. Um, so I just started off with the question of like, let's meet and let's figure it out. Um, and over the course of like a, the week after the, the social distancing order sort of like went into effect, um, during one of those Zoom meetings, I was introduced to Julie, um, who uh, then brought me to that initial Cypher meeting. Um, but prior to that, we were looking at ways in which we could support the community-led efforts. So we were, we were, the key things we were thinking about were like, like documentation of impact, um, ways to support the Seattle Artist Relief Fund and like get money in that direction. Because in that first two weeks, we saw millions of dollars being like directed towards the Seattle Foundation, the Small Business Association of like South Lake Union and like basically like all of this like major, major amount of finances were directed at these institutions that were not necessarily transparent um, or even like held accountable to the independent artists that live and work in Seattle, specifically like low income individuals, like artists of color, like there was no recognition for the, like the ground level work that gets done that like truly creates what arts in Seattle is um, and gives Seattle like its reputation for being an artistic hub. Um, so I was, I was, I was frustrated and um the way to like deal with that frustration was to gather in community. And um, during that first Cypher meeting, I sort of like found my place with um, the, with the CACE and with the folks that are on this panel right now. And um, I personally could not be more grateful for that. Likewise. Ariel, do you want to share, add to that anything? Sure. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm sometimes a little bit the odd duck in the room because I am such a, I'm so focused in arts administration and so, and I am in this weird paradox of being part of, an, of a structure that requires me to think in certain ways, but also our organization is directly intended to support independent artists. And the same with Kyle, like things started rolling out and I just saw most of our members lose jobs, lose contracts, lose everything, and it was full stop. So, which is, I think the thing that we aren't hearing in the media is that it isn't, it wasn't a slow trickle. It wasn't that folks couldn't do a show. It was that these artists immediately lost income without any kind of repercussion. And the freelance unemployment piece has been slow to establish. So there also wasn't any kind of recourse in terms of like meeting the need that was, was immediate because of the loss of that income. So for me being a part of this, it's just, I'm, I'm, deeply inspired by this group of people. I'm glad to have a place and really it's for me just how do how am I able to affect change from the inside out because I do have this positional power that I am in but also I'm one of the few ETs of color in the city. So it's there's there's a balance that I'm trying to draw of like I know I there are some rooms I'm just not invited in and that's a reality that I have so how can I still affect that change and and get involved because of the position I hold. Word. Thank y'all so much. So, um, yeah, just so y'all know, we, we, this is a relatively new uh, iteration of, of these efforts. Um, to summarize is what this slide is. Uh, Osea and I's relationship really comes back and then the connection to the COVID-19 um, autonomous work really goes back to Hip Hop Occupies to Decolonize um, Days, which emerged from Occupy Seattle. It was autonomous, but in solidarity to Occupy Seattle, which really flowed into a trajectory of work around equitable um, development in Seattle that was Seattle aced, uh, but combining with the um, labor analysis that Laurie and Michelle and Eric are bringing and um, this, this mutual aid and, and direct support and advocacy that Ariel and Kyle were bringing, it was just a very powerful um, pocket of folks. And um, so that is, from there, that's how we get to SACE. Um, we decided to combine, uh, folded the old Seattle ACE social media into this effort because the alignment was already there and the attachment to name was never very important. Um, and, it, and it really comes down to a lot of trust, trust that is um, stemming from shared values. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip this page because we're a little short on time. This is on our website, which will drop in the chat box. But I, I do want to read, um, let's see if you're down to read, like the value statement. Um, that would be dope. Um, yeah, so um, we embrace the value statement established through collective process by the broader Seattle COVID-19 Mutual Aid Solidarity Network, which holds we aim to cultivate a politics of international solidarity and local mutual aid within a creative, resilient, multi-generational horizon of decolonial, anti-capitalist, feminist, queer, disability, and sex worker liberation. We are building community power, decentralized control, and autonomy. Thank you so much. So a few things that a few initiatives, and I'll go through this part pretty quickly so that there's really time for Q&A. Um, as, as Kyle was talking about resource navigation, um, compiling, uh, Kyle and his, his squad was already doing a lot of that, as was um, Northwest Folklife, and um, documenting impact, which got channeled into an open letter to advocate for what type of funding is going to be the most accessible for artists. Um, does anybody want to speak on that real quickly? From the team, from the team? I'm happy yeah. to speak on that. Oh, Matthew, you go. Sure. So uh, as we were documenting all this information and it became very clear that the need was so high and we knew that the need wasn't being met in uh, direct assistance that needed to go out, out the door immediately, um, as was being said earlier, a lot of the grants and stuff that's going to be funneled through nonprofits, like we might not see that for months, it might be years, who knows if we ever see it. So um, Ijomo, Aluo, um, Gabe, and uh, Ebony, uh, whose last names I forget. Uh, I Arunga. Arunga. Um, they put together this GoFundMe, which was uh, the Seattle Artist Relief Fund amid COVID-19. And the goal of that fund was to raise as much money as they could. And once they started uh, raising the money to start taking applications for direct cash assistance for artists in need, uh, independent artists in need. Um, so, the fund looks like it's raised about $522,000, $523,000 now on this page. I know that they probably have raised another fifty to hundred k through just people emailing and getting in touch with Langston outside of this. Um, but uh, what the reality is, is that they, last I talked to Ajoma, they had about 1,200 applications that they weren't able to fill. And then they had at that point, two or 300 people on a waiting list once they were able to get to the million dollars. Now, the, the gap in funding uh, when we sent out our open letter was about $600,000. So that gap has lessened by about $100,000 since we sent out the open letter, which is a really good move in the right direction. But still, uh, we're, we're having a really hard time getting folks to uh, prioritize individual artists and cash relief uh, in the now as we're looking at these more big picture things that might need to happen in the future. So um, that's, that's one of our current struggles. And that's something that we uh, you know, want to be upfront about. We, we feel like it's been a very successful effort uh, to get that cash into folks' hands. And it, it has truly helped many, many artists from losing their homes, being able to feed themselves, uh, get their grocery, their pharmaceuticals, everything. Um, but as with many cases, uh, it, it comes in capitalism, there are just gaps that people are falling through the cracks of and figuring out how to um, how to fill those gaps is one of our number one goals. Kyle, did you have anything to add to that? You look like you were gonna. Oh no, that was awesome. That was, that was great. Beautiful. All right. So in addition to that direct advocacy for our trusted community members, um, organizing, intersecting, rabble rousing, just finding any opportunity that we can to intervene on, um, to bolster the community rooted solutions, the ones that are originating from um, folks that we know share values, 
but also to intervene on some of the um, other approaches, I should say. And finally, uh, I worded, okay, so I made this last night at like, Mashad and I was like midnight. So creating a bureaucracy to interact with bureaucracies is how it came out. But what is meant by that is the establishment of facts. Um, in my realm of experience, all the cultural organizing work I've done has been very community oriented, very organic, um, autonomous, horizontal. But realizing that there was opportunity now to create some solid systemic change and to have a, a new team really um, in, enthused and experienced in this arena. Uh, one of the projects of SACE that's the most exciting to me right now is the establishment of the Free, Freelance Artist Consortium of Seattle. Mashad, do you want to read out this one? Sure. Uh, the Freelance Artist Consortium of Seattle is a grassroots union created by cultural workers from a wide range of disciplines, media, and genres, including performers, writers, visual and media artists, technicians, in or, and technicians in and around Seattle. In accordance with CA slash Seattle ACE, we are working towards an equitable, resilient, and sustainable arts ecosystem that includes fostering and strengthening solidarity and mutual support between artists, artist-run spaces, and organizations, nurturing solidarity with freelance laborers and other sectors locally and beyond, the sharing of resources and information, advocating, promoting, and monitoring fair labor practices and wage equity, building self-representation and self-determination for cultural workers and securing meaningful artist representation on arts-related governmental boards and commissions, and building a youth-oriented, youth-steered arm of this effort. So the overall intent and purpose of this is to be able to establish more direct um, communication and interfacing ability between the different structures that we need to work with, which are designed to serve us and yet do not. Um, that's sort of like the big overarching issue uh, that FACTS focuses on. Thank you so much. Um, we get uh, the question a lot, people asking what's the difference between SACE and FACTS and, and the way that I like to break it down is SACE is um, Sace is the wind and water. Uh, I love how Poesia has said it before, the fluidity of cultural labor is, um, is, is actually a power, a point of power, a point of strength in um, artistry and, and culturally rooted activism. However, we do have to operate in a system that is not built to appreciate and um, understand that type of structure. So, so facts is the, uh, earth and metal elements to that wind and water. Um, so this just ways to plug in and support. Again, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna compile some links for all of y'all or maybe during the break uh, for that what has been referenced. But definitely, as Kwasi said earlier, starting with yourself and, and your people, there's no, um, a lot of this work to be authentic is deeply intuitive. It, it, it has to do with um, starting within your reach, within your agency, and, and within your heart and your soul, um, supporting your own creativity and that of artists around you, uh, your community and family, um, chosen or birth, challenging systems, organizing, uh, definitely free to connect to, oops, I knew that was gonna happen. Um, also connecting with us, if you are a creative, uh, I would love to see if y'all would drop in a chat, if you identify as an artist or express yourselves in ways that are, that are generative, go ahead and um, say something in the chat box or drop a link, I would love to check it out. Um, we welcome you to uh, sign up to be a member of FACTS and uh, follow us social media, both SACE, social media and the COVID-19 Mutual Aid Solidarity Network social media. Um, and of course, Friday is May Day. So the final slide here is that. Um, there's some exciting actions being planned that involve both um, safely dispersed forms of uh, direct action as well as an online aspect to participation. And I hope you will follow the COVID-19 Mutual Aid account for more information as that becomes publicly available. How are we doing on time, everybody? 
my, my, my Highline facilitator, Shannon. Hello, I think we're doing good. How about we take a five minute pause right now and um, give folks time to enter some questions into the Q&A and then um, come back. Does that sound good? Sounds okay. good. All right, so community, uh, we'll just take five minute break for you to get up, move around. Um, maybe you need to get to class or work on some homework. Um, whatever it is, just take this pause and we'll resume at 1.20. Again, please enter some questions into the Q&A um, um, button at the bottom of your screen. And we are going to be um, listening to some music during our intermission from um, some incredible Seattle artists. So uh, enjoy this pause and we'll be right back with you. All right, everybody, uh, welcome back. Highline family and community, Seattle community, and hey, maybe we even have folks outside of Seattle or the state. So we're gonna now start with some questions for our panelists and we have a couple of great questions, but please feel free to submit more questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're having trouble accessing the Q&A feature, feel free to use the chat. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start with our questions here and, and Bob, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen there. Awesome. All right, so the first question. This is for Kyle, I believe. Okay, so uh, to the person <laughs> that said that he is not an angry person, but he got angry. Uh, number one, what was the first thing that you did after you got upset? And number two, what were some obstacles you encountered to doing something about, uh, or like what got you upset? Yeah, totally. So, I. Uh... I would say like the first thing that I did was I connected with community. Um, I reached out to um, my friends who lost their jobs. I reached out to um, some family and, but mainly like I just reached out to folks that um, I knew were struggling to find some sort of path um, through this chaos and um, establish some like collective solidarity to like get through it all. So, um, what I did and the first thing I did was I just posted on Facebook being like, let's congregate, let's, let's meet, let's talk, like basically have like sort of like a round table discussion about what we can do. Um, because, uh, a crisis like this, uh, is similar in ways to like a lot of the inequities that we face before COVID hit our global society. So, um, it, it, There are often times where we feel isolated and alone when we're not being forced to isolate. And the only way to get through that is to connect with the folks that empower you and empower the community in which you surround yourself. Um, and that was sort of like my saving grace was connecting with folks digitally via Zoom and being like, yo, let's like, what the fuck's happening? Like, what, what, is, what is going on right now? What can we do? And people brought solid ideas. They were like, all right, let's reach out to community. Let's, like, we see all this funding coming to Seattle Foundation. Let's start gathering, like, the impact, like, the amount of impact that people are experiencing so that we can then present that and be like, cool, y'all are raising $13 million for Seattle Foundation right now. Like, we've now documented, like, over $2 million worth of need and, like, please direct that money to the community led efforts that are getting that f that funding out like immediately because there's this bureaucratic like bureaucratic like system that like involves a lot of red tape um that is completely and utterly inequitable it's people with connections people that like a lot of these major relief found like foundations that are in existence now are like if you're an artist, you need to prove that like, say a musician, you need to prove that you have like three studio albums that have been released and like, there's an access barrier there. It's like, okay, so a musician that's released three albums deserves funding more than an, a musician who is strictly gig based and works events, works at like, like house shows or at different venues um, throughout the city. Like there, there's a major discrepancy there. So um, it, it started with analyzing that and then connecting with community. Um, and that led us down the path to creating this open letter that sort of like, it was, it was a plea to be like, we need funding. 
inequities have existed for so long and this crisis has perpetuated them. So um, that sort of helped alleviate some of my anger. Um, and um, yeah, I forgot what the second part of that question was. And I think I may have, oh, obstacles that I encountered. Um, I'm a theater maker. Uh, the way that we do work is gathering in space together. <laughs> very difficult to do when you're when you're in your bedroom uh, and you have to connect with people on zoom um but because we're in this digital age and thankful that this isn't happening in the 90s where we would be on like email or like like snail mail connecting with each other um really grateful that like the 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 barriers that we would have faced um sort of don't exist but the the barriers that we're currently facing are um like the hierarchical hierarchical structures of like the nonprofit industrial complex and like bureaucracy that is sort of dictating how relief happens. Um, yeah, so that's sort of like what we're all facing now. But Michelle, do you have your hand up? Yeah, so, you know, Lori and I have been in a conversation for months, I think probably since like either November or December, um, at least between like the two of us and with our, our uh, colleague, Eric Paget about these structural issues and the and reading <laughs> excuse me, reports that uh, different uh, local governmental organizations have put together which document these inequities and make it so very clear that uh, the system was broken and the in the context of suddenly having everything that I might have had you know been working on and investing in suddenly disappear without any further notice um, overnight, like literally overnight, uh, it, it took that anger and it made it, that anger then, be, it, it, something transformed in regards to how I related to the anger because the context was different. And what I found was that there was no longer a question of how do we go about it, but simply when, what are we doing right now to, to address and, re and mitigate this issue because there may have been certain measures which appeared to me to be like sort of like diplomatic ways of going about of remedying the issue and, and inciting systemic change. But due to the urgency and also the utter failure systematically and, ca and uh, sort of catastrophically um, in regards to serving people in my industry, um, it has immunitized all of that anger into focused response, which is the non the um, the facts project. So I I think it's the thing which I've been thinking about in context of sort of the whole COVID crisis is that there is a lot of stress on a system that was not robust to begin, and therefore things are flexing and shifting, and we get to shape that. That's a very rare opportunity. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for that good question too. I don't know if y'all noticed um, that we had a new, a new person join us who um, was tied up a little bit earlier, but I'm so happy that uh, Marshall is here. And Marshall, you wanna just introduce yourself and then say how you came to this effort? Absolutely. What's going on everybody? First, I uh, wanna say thank you for putting your energy and effort behind the cause that we all feel so passionately about. Uh, my name is Marshall. I'm a musician and uh, event organizer around town. I'm also a basketball coach. Um, and uh, basically how I got to uh, this Zoom meeting that I'm in now with uh, you wonderful people um, is that uh, like many of people, I was uh, ready to go on tour. We were headed to uh, South by Southwest in Austin and we were going to make a full loop around the nation, a 50 day national tour. And obviously uh, we had to make the tragic decision to call it off. Um, and as a result, you're kind of left scrambling. Hey, where do I stand as a musician in this community? And then uh, we began uh, to, to, to understand there was a larger conversation being had that, um, that was building procedures and, and structural power for years to come here in Seattle while COVID was happening. And uh, as an artist, you're used to getting left out of conversations. Unfortunately, you're used to giving your art for no money. Um, and uh, something about it made me want to speak up and say, hey, you know, I don't think this is right. I, I always haven't felt this is right. And it was uh, that 
statement on an Instagram st uh, uh, story that led me uh, to, to really understand what Julie was doing and, and and she introduced me to the rest of the group and to be able to sit here on a, on now probably 20 different zoom calls and to be able to learn from people that really know what's going on and aren't just upset about what's happening uh, has been a great learning experience for me and I'm just excited to be able to use my musical platform to uplift this cause and, and learn and, and hopefully be able to be a, a mouthpiece to uh, the great work that's going on. I've been really excited about it. Um, and it's one of the things that has been actually driving me to stay positive and involved during uh, COVID because I'm sad, you know, I'm used to playing. I'm really somebody that plays a show a week, if not more, you know, you might catch me at Mojams, then Marmalade um, and then a show of my own. So uh, without having this sense of community, it's been great to, to have something to rally around as kind of uh, Kyle spoke to earlier. So much love to everybody. Julie, I hope that uh, answers. Oh, it was great. Um Marsha, you're also a really dope organizer and, and youth service worker, and um, we're all learning together. But I do want you to go back to the conversation um, with venues that you- Yeah, absolutely. Through. Yeah, because you kind of grazed over it. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, I'm PR GQ, but uh, what do you want me to tell about it? So um, just to lend context, I guess, to those of you still out there, there, was, there is also being organized a, a coalition of venues that, um, you know, it's also an industry in need, but historically hasn't had great relationships with artists and um, have been using in their messaging the plights of, of artists in ways that are not consistent with our understanding of um, their, their, a lot of their ethics. And so Marshall, I don't know if you wanna. Absolutely, so uh, Julie C just put uh, my argument very succinctly and, and uh, powerfully uh, me, I kind of just uh, saw that this coalition had been formed, saw the language around uh, what the coalition was attempting to do to garner our support of the community, really talking about how the artist was. And as I've, you know, me, like I said, I've, I've played probably over 200 shows in the past three years in Seattle. So I've experienced the great ends of venues, the not so great ends of venues. I've experienced the whole spectrum. And from my experience, I know for a fact that artists need to be representing artists. We can't have anybody else, whether it be venues or whoever, speaking on behalf of us and thinking that the money and the funds are gonna trickle down somehow to the artists from someone that's played 200 shows in Seattle and still, you know, struggles out here and has to moonlight as a basketball coach to, do, to, to support what I love. I can tell you, we can't trust someone else uh, hoping will give us money we have to secure that directly from the state or direct whoever is administering funds we need to be a part of that conversation it needs to be ahead straight to artists so that's what i said and there's some backlash uh it sparked a real big conversation it actually like i put on twitter and like within a whole day there's already four thousand views over a hundred engagements i'm just like oh goodness gracious uh and it, it was fun it was exciting and uh now i feel like i've just learned so much more about it and we've actually seen some attempt on that coalition side to to understand what we have going on and uh you know we're working hard to make sure everybody involved in the situation including ourselves is accountable for that thank you so much yeah yeah are there any other questions we got one from martin sandy about the organization since there are so many people have applied for assistance what criteria do you use for allocating the funds collected and I also just want to say to the audience members, don't be shy about posting questions because we, we still got some time, but we don't have any more questions after this one. Yeah, so important distinction, um, SACE is not a funds dispersing entity, but um, Poesia, do you want to speak a little bit about the process um, for COVID-19 uh, People's Fund? Yeah, I just want to say I got to get out of here, but thank you for all, all for being here and uh, thank you for all your passion. I'll see you all around. Thank you, Matthew. Um, yeah, so, um, so in regards to the money being distributed by the mutual aid COVID-19 group, um, um, so uh, the way we look at money is through like an anti-capitalist approach. So what's most valuable is community and the wellness of our community. Um, and so um, when, so the first um, difficulty we had was accessing the money. So um, GoFundMe gave us a really hard time 
of being able to like access the resources because we had approved there was humans behind um, because there was such an influx of money. So I think like within a week we've raised a hundred thousand um, dollars. And so like, it, um, so some of the people that oh, yeah. are on like on the I go turned fund it, me. So it's muted. Oh, sorry. Am I muted? What are you up to? Oh, um, but um, so uh, the first thing was uh, developing a core team of people that had the same um, analysis and had the same principles, ethics and values around money. Um, and so we decided it was gonna be a woman led decision make making process and it was gonna be led by black and brown and native women. And so that's the majority, that's pretty much everybody. And we do have like one white, um, white person or a white um, identified person that's like non-binary that is also part of the decision making but their role is to hold the money um, and then they just they're like our accountant so basically they write out the checks they have no decision making um, they can put their opinion but because of the way capitalism works and we know that the one of the groups that is the biggest disenfranchised are predominantly black and brown women when it comes to money and when it comes to um, just basic getting paid. Like um, even if we're college educated, black and brown women still get paid disproportionately less than either men of color or white women. And so that's a fact. Like I'm not even gonna argue anybody. It's like been shown over and over the reality of like capitalism and how it's gendered. Um, and so, um, the first discussion was like, what, what do we all feel about money? And so in this process, we develop like our own like um, method of distributed money. And so one of the things we all brought forth, we wanted to support people that were resisting and people that were organizing, that was a priority. And one of the groups that is currently organizing and resisting are people that are in prison. And so there is a vast need of money and resources. A lot of those people, don't have access to healthcare testing and are pretty much disregarded by society in this current pandemic. And so we allocated $500 because we're like, we can't just give people like $100. That's not really gonna like help them during a crisis. So what's the most we can give people with, um, so we're like 500. So that's, the, that's the, our minimum is $500 because we know there's like a necessity and people aren't gonna ask for money unless they need it. Another thing, a conversation was who's getting disenfranchised? Who's not gonna get a stimulus check? Who's not getting like um, paid sick leave? Who's not getting like uh, cover their hours? Um, we all know it's people that work um, in like agriculture, farm workers, people that are working in low paid jobs in healthcare system, either caretakers, nannies. Um, we also, when we look at like um, the workforce, like, um, like who's not gonna be able to file for unemployment, um, which is like sex workers. So we also did a gender of race and class analysis to uh, resource distribution by the government and who was getting left out. So whoever's getting left out, that's our priority to make sure they get access to that money. And so we, um, and another thing is language barriers. So a lot of, there's um, a lot of undocumented peoples that aren't getting supported by either the government or community or don't have access to resources because of the language. So. So we establish a, a translation team of people. And so, so those are all teams now. Each, there's a translation team pretty much for every language and we have like 12 languages. So those folks are the ones that are translation, translating our materials. And then um, we're about to put live um, our, uh, our online petition for money. We do have live our online petition for food. So right now you can still apply and ask for support for food and somebody will deliver food for you in your house. But the funding distribution, um, we've taken a little bit of more time in terms of like opening the general pool to develop an ethical like um, online like petition where people don't feel like that putting their name or putting their information is gonna put them at risk. Um, because a lot of undocumented communities are afraid to ask for money because they're afraid ICE is gonna get a hold of our, our paperwork and harass them. So that was like a priority was all like, okay, who's who in communities working with undocumented people that we can trust with a big chunk of money that we know they will distribute that money. 
Um, and so that was our, our first priority was all like, who's already doing the work? How do we build with them and make sure that the communities they're working with are taken care of? And then when we open the general pool, um, it's all going to be based on like, are you a sex worker and you undocumented, but you don't have to like state all these things is mostly like, um, there's like a question and answer. Um, but then like what's most important is like you're going to have a space for people to share their lived experience, how COVID-19 is impacting us. And that's what's most important is, um, is hearing like um, people and like um, right now we have $230,000, 75,000 have already been allocated specifically to undocumented peoples. But um, but uh, we still have like a large pool and we're about to do our second round of funding for uh, people who have family members incarcerated and people in the detention center. So even though um, we, we can, we're gonna continue fundraising and thinking of creative ways. Um, and it, even if people don't get the first round of money, you can still, there's still gonna be possibilities of getting financial support, but also like we also are realistic and know that 230,000 is not enough, you know? This money should be coming from the government. Um, because undocumented peoples, peoples who work in different industries, they still contribute taxes to our economy and are, are being neglected by the government. That's why we're doing this work is because of necessity. Um, it's not because we're like, just we have all this money and that's why people gave us all this money because they know how the capitalist system works and who's going to be disenfranchised. Um, and I think um, what's most important when we're working with money is understanding that it's a piece of paper what's most important is making sure that people stay alive and people are fed and people know that there's a community that supports them if they are also are in a hardship situation um whereas like the government isn't checking up on people the government isn't delivering food to people the government isn't giving masks to people like that's all us in community doing that work um, and so, um, so we also recognize our limitations and the fact that we are still currently living in a capitalist society and we're still seeing all the evil things that come with that, which is like corporations got a big chunk of payout and workers, we just got crumbs. A, a hundred, a thousand two hundred check is nothing, you know, for the, um, for the necessity that is needed in community. So that's why we're also pushing for a huge change in the way um, the economy and the way money is being distributed in this country and in the work the way workers are being dehumanized on a daily every day so that these corporations can maintain their million dollar profit while the rest of us are starving and dying for a few crumbs. So well said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. I think that all of your guys' answers really exemplify what it looks like when people um, who are most impacted or people who are at the center of whatever it is going on design what it looks like to, to care for one another um, rather than like you've spoken about bigger entities. We know the government doesn't have us or nonprofits, which, you know, are so far removed from the folks actually um, that are getting the money. And so the way that you all have thought through, you know, both everything with Stacey, but also with the COVID um, mutual aid stuff in terms of how things get distributed really shows um, the kind of thinking that all institutions should be doing, but they don't unless they're really um, listening to and have people at the table that are valued um, who are impacted and who know, or who are connected to communities most impacted too. So. Um, thank you uh, for that. This I want to um, be cognizant of time and think we need to wrap up our Q&A session. But before we do, I wanted to give each one of our panelists an opportunity to tell us how to connect with you moving forward. Um, for our audience, this will be um, recorded and put up on our um, on our website next week. So you'll be able to access some of these resources, but also um, you know, there's a, some incredible work being done here. And so if y'all want to give a moment to say where to find you or where to um, connect to some of the efforts that you're doing that we haven't already shared, that'd be great. Um, I'm just going to put, I just always put my cell phone number. People can text me. <laughs> um, I said I was going to put a bunch of links and I didn't because I didn't quite know how to do that. 
<laughs> without changing the screen. Um, and yeah, if y'all have any follow-up questions, just shoot me a text message. You're incredible, thank, Julie. Thank you all so much for um, being here and, and sticking around. Uh, I'm a, you can find me on the internet uh, on all social media platforms. I'm at Mashad Savage, and that is now in the chat. All right, y'all can uh, find me on pretty much anywhere at Just Marshall, and uh, also my band, uh, Marshall Law Band. Check us out. Uh, I run the majority of the social media, so all you got to do is shoot me a DM or comment there, and I'm, I'm going to get at you. Thank you again for having us and, and uh, you know, even these type of things we're learning as uh, we're talking to y'all. So yeah, it's helpful to you, but it's definitely helpful to us too. So thank you. Um, um, oh, you go. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, you can go, you're good. Okay, um, so you can find my artist name, um, Poesia Mariarte on Instagram and then just my website. I only just use Facebook to connect with family and friends, but um, uh, you can usually find me there with my big like name. So uh, Maria Luisa Guillén Valdovinos, but, um, but I'll, I'll post my Instagram and then just my website. Um, yeah. Um, I'm gonna post my, uh, my email uh, so you can all, all connect with me that way. Um, one like action item that I wanted to present to the attendees. So um, one of the things that as a coalition that we are, we're recognizing and facing um, as well is capacity and our ability to get things done while also like maintaining our own livelihood and being able to like function as humans in this, uh, in this world. So um, I understand that the majority of you are probably students at Highline Community College and like you're probably enrolled in classes and like have work and other things that you have going on. So I just want to like reiterate that like if you're feeling isolated or you're feeling like you're not able to like actually engage in any community work, you can just start by simply just sharing the efforts of like coalition, like our coalition's efforts and other community led and horizontal coalition efforts as well. Um, and it's just simply like sharing the links, um, saying that you support the efforts of like COVID-19 mutual aid um, network. Like those are simple things that you, you can begin doing to stay engaged and stay, um, involved in the uh, the work that's being done um, at this time. So that's sort of an action item. And then you can also just hit us up if you want to get involved. Like we're, we're sharing all of our contact info. So if you want to, if you want to join in, uh, just let us know. Um, I, yeah. I put my... Oh, you muted again, Aria. Having issues with my controls. Um, I just put my chat, my email in the chat. So that's the best way to reach me. All right. Well, um, let me see. Let me get my let me get my next steps here. So um, thank you, panelists. Thank you so much again. Um, you know, it's weird being not together. So if you were here, we would be standing up, applauding, um, yelling, whatever it is to really thank you for being here today. Um, and thank you for everything that you do for our community, for, for the communities um, here in Seattle. Um, so for our community of attendees, um, in the chat feature, you'll find a link for our Unity Week survey. Uh, your feedback is super critical in, en in enhancing our programs, and so we would greatly appreciate it if you would give us your feedback. Uh, tomorrow is our final day of Unity Week, which kind of brings me some sadness because it's just been an inspiring week all around, um, featuring Eileen Yoshina. Um, so we've also included that Zoom link in our chat feature. Um, and her title for the presentation tomorrow is Revolution from the Inside Out, the Power of Educators of Color in Transforming Education. So um, it's going to be a, a powerful presentation. Um, so again, thank you so much. Thank you, Julie C. Thank you, Ariel, Mishad, Kyle. Uh, all the other panelists, um, thank you so much for being here today and have, have, have a great rest of your week.